Chapter 2. The Carpet Bag I stuffed a shirt or two into my old carpet bag, tucked it under my arm, and started for Cape Horn in the Pacific. Quitting the good city of old Manhattan, I duly arrived in New Bedford. It was on a Saturday night in December. Much was I disappointed upon learning that the little packet for Nantucket had already sailed, and that no way of reaching that place would offer till the following Monday. As most young candidates for the pains and penalties of whaling stop at this same New Bedford, thence to embark upon their voyage, it may as well be related that I, for one, had no idea of so doing, for my mind was made up to sail in no other than a Nantucket craft, because there was a fine, boisterous something about everything connected with that famous old island, which amazingly pleased me. Besides, though New Bedford has of late been gradually monopolizing the business of whaling, and though in this manner poor old Nantucket is now much behind her, yet Nantucket was her great original, the tire of this Carthage, the place where the first dead American whale was stranded. Where else but from Nantucket did these aboriginal whalemen, the red men, first sally out in canoes to give chase to the Leviathan, and where but from Nantucket, too, did the first adventurous little sloop put forth, partly laden with imported cobblestones, so goes the story, to throw at the whales in order to discover that they were nigh enough to risk a harpoon from the bowsprit. Now having a night, a day, and still another night following before me in New Bedford, ere I could embark for my destined port, it became a matter of concernment where I was to eat and sleep meanwhile. It was a very dubious-looking, nay, a very dark and dismal night, bitingly cold and cheerless. I knew no one in the place. With anxious grapnels I had sounded my pocket, and only brought up a few pieces of silver. So wherever you go, Ishmael, said I to myself, as I stood in the middle of a dreary street, shouldering my bag, and comparing the gloom toward the north with the darkness toward the south, wherever in your wisdom you may conclude to lodge for the night, my dear Ishmael, be sure to inquire the price, and don't be too particular. With halting steps I paced the streets, and passed the sign of the crossed harpoons, but it looked too expensive and jolly there, Further on, from the bright red windows of the Swordfish Inn, there came such fervent rays that it seemed to have melted the packed snow and ice from before the house, for everywhere else the congealed frost lay ten inches thick in a hard asphaltic pavement. Rather weary for me when I stuck my foot against the flinty projections, because the hard, remorseless service of soles of my boots were in a most miserable plight. Too expensive and jolly again, thought I, pausing one moment to watch the broad glare in the street, and hear the sounds of the tinkling glasses within. But go on, Ishmael, said I at last. Don't you hear? Get away from before the door. Your patched boots are stopping the way. So on I went. I now by instinct followed the streets that took me waterward, for there doubtless were the cheapest, if not the cheeriest, inns. Such dreary streets, blocks of blackness, not houses, on either hand, and here and there a candle, like a candle moving about in a tomb. At this hour of the night, of the last day of the week, that quarter of the town proved all but deserted. But presently I came to a smoky light proceeding from a low, wide building, the door of which stood invitingly open. I had a careless look, as if it were meant for the use of the, of the public. So entering, the first thing I did was to stumble over an ash-box in the porch. Ha! thought I, as the flying particles almost choked me. Are these ashes from that destroyed city, Gomorrah? but the crossed harpoons and the swordfish, then this must needs be the sign of the trap. However, I picked myself up, and hearing a loud voice within, pushed on and opened a second interior door. It seemed the great black parliament sitting in Tophet, a hundred black faces turned round in their rows to peer, and beyond a black angel of doom was beating a book in a pulpit. It was a negro church and the preacher's text was about the blackness of darkness, and the weeping and wailing and teeth gnashing there. Ha! Ishmael muttered I, becking out. Wretched entertainment at the sign of the trap. Moving on, I at last came to a dim sort of light not far from the docks, and heard a forlorn creaking in the air, and looking up, saw a swinging sign over the door with a white painting upon it, faintly representing a tall, straight jet of misty spray, and these words underneath, the Sprouter Inn, Peter Coffin. Coffin? Sprouter? Rather ominous in that particular connection, thought I. But it is a common name in Nantucket, they say, and I suppose this Peter here is an emigrant from there. As the light looked so dim, and the place, for the time, looked quiet enough, 
and the dilapidated little wooden house itself looked as if it might have been carted here from the ruins of some burnt district, and as the swinging sign had a poverty-stricken sort of creak to it, I thought that here was a very spot for cheap lodgings and the best of pea coffee. It was a queer sort of place, a gable-ended old house, one side palsied as it were, and leaning over sadly. It stood on a sharp, bleak corner where that tempestuous wind, Eurocladon, kept up a worse howling than ever it did about poor Paul's tossed craft. Eurocladon, nevertheless, is a mighty, pleasant zephyr to anyone indoors with his feet on the hob quietly toasting for bed. In judging of that tempestuous wind called Eurocladon, says an old writer, of whose works I possess the only copy extant, it maketh a marvellous difference whether thou lookest out at it from a glass window where the frost is all on the outside, or whether thou observest from the sashless window where the frost is on both sides, and of which the white death is the only glazier. True enough, thought I, as this passage occurred to my mind. Old black letter, thou reasonest well. Yet these eyes are windows, and this body of mine is the house. What a pity they didn't stop up the chinks and the crannies, though, and thrust a little lint in here and there. But it's too late to make any improvements now. The universe is finished, the cobblestone is on, and the chips were carted off a million years ago. Poor Lazarus there, chattering his teeth against the curbstone for his window, and shaking off his tatters to his shiverings. He might plug up both ears with rags and put corncob into his mouth, and yet that would not keep out the tempestuous Eurocladon. Eurocladon, says old Dives in his red silken wrapper. He had a redder one afterward. Poo-poo. What a fine frosty night. How Orion glitters. What northern lights. Let them talk of their oriental summer climes of everlasting conservatories. Give me the privilege of making my own summer with my own coals. But what thinks Lazarus? Can he warm his blue hands by holding them up to the grand northern lights? Would not Lazarus rather be in Sumatra than here? Would he not far rather lay him down lengthwise upon the line of the equator? Yea, ye gods, go down to the fiery pit itself in order to keep out this frost. Now that Lazarus should lie stranded there on the curbstone before the door of dives, this is more wonderful than an iceberg should be moored to one of the Molochus. Yet dives himself, he too lives like a czar in an ice palace made of frozen sighs, and being a president of a temperance society, he only drinks the tepid tears of orphans. But no more of this blubbering now, we are going a-wailing, and there's plenty of that yet to come. Let us scrape the ice from our frosted feet and see what sort of place this spouter may be. End of chapter 2